What's up, guys? This is David Gordon. As promised, this is the video expose of some of the misdeeds of Church Militant um, and those of her founder, Michael Voris, uh, in the recent weeks that have come to light. Also, it's an explanation for my termination slash resignation slash walkout today and the walkout of many of my colleagues, many of my talented colleagues um, from Church Militant and their resignation. Uh, you guys are going to have to bear with me. It's been a really long day, so I am, I'm very tired, and this is going to be stream of consciousness. I'm going to try and keep it not ranty. Uh, first things you should know, um, this isn't petty or vindictive. Uh, you know, we, all the employees who left today loved their jobs. They loved the organization that they worked for. We believed in the mission statement and still do believe in the mission statement uh, to protect Holy Mother Church from slander and attack and to evangelize the world, especially through uh, video means. Um, these are things that we still cherish. And that's exactly one of the reasons why we have to come forward, because sunlight is a great disinfectant. Um, exposure is a way of kind of policing these nonprofits, Catholic ap apostolates, um, and I want to purify church militant, and I ultimately think that this is for the best. It's also for the common good, for those who hear the message uh, and, and watch old vortices and hear Michael Voris's messaging and the way he touched the bishops and the popes, you know, the, his takes on them, the tenor with which he approached them. You know, they have a right to know certain things that were going on that would have affected um, his tone and maybe... Uh, brought to bear certain certain problematic elements in how he spoke of the shepherds of the church. It's important that you guys should know that. Those who donate to Church Militant, you should also know what's going on and where your funds are going. You have an interest in, in the content it's putting out and also just that your donations and funds are being managed properly. So um, there's a serious common good interest at stake here. This is not mere um, pettiness. Uh, ultimately, because Church Militant has an admirable mission statement, admirable goals, I wish the best for it, but it can't reach those goals and it's never going to live up to its mission statement in its current form. Uh, the board of Church Militant is incompetent and bumbling and they, you know, they've not lived up to their fiduciary duties. They've completely been negligent on their fiduciary duties. They didn't even know the duties that they owed to the nonprofit. They didn't know the duties they owed to the organization. They were hardly exercising any oversight at all. I had to explain to them, to some members of the board of directors last week, what the bylaws were and what they said. I had to do that. Um, and they were totally not exercising oversight over um, Michael Voris in his CEO capacity or over the fact whether or not we were being faithful to our core identity and to our binding mission statement. They, they just they had no idea that they even had to do things. Essentially, the board would, you know, kind of pretend to meet once in a while and rubber stamp through um, the the poor ideas of Michael Voris while exercising no oversight. And this has just come to all of our attention that we had this kind of empty suit of a board. And, um, you know, that needs to be exposed because the, the organization is not going to be reformed until they have a competent board made up of members that can have ideas and thoughts um, and that are going to propose what's best for the apostolate. So, um, th there are a few things I want to talk to you about, uh, today, and I'm going to read ultimately a letter that I penned to the board when some facts came to light about Michael Voris. Um, and as you can imagine, it's that Michael Voris ha was living up till, up to recently. I don't know if it's ceased yet. I don't know if his behaviors have ceased yet, but living a life that involved active homosexuality. 
and we're going to get into the allegations that we're talking about. So while he has the gall to sit up there and preach to sweet old Catholic women on the vortex about matters of spirituality, he's living a life of homosexuality, one of the screaming sins, you know, sins that cry to heaven for vengeance. That's what's going on. It's utterly despicable. It's two-faced. Um, it's fraudulent. It's fraudulent to hold yourself out as some kind of a beacon of, of Catholic manhood and Catholic virtue and be living this double life, uh, stepping in the limelight. You know, if you dare to step into the limelight as a Catholic figure, sure, we've all made mistakes. But if you're going to be a Catholic spokesman in the present, you better not be living a double life. You better be, um, you know, everybody falls, everybody has certain minor vices, but to, to be grappling with certain vices and holding yourself out as a beacon of, of virtue, no, that doesn't work. Uh, when you're the face of an organization, you're attracting people based on this mission statement, this alleged adherence to Catholic morality. It's a betrayal of everybody in the organization. And that's how we saw it, as a betrayal. So... Uh, you know, Michael Voris that was engaging in some actively homosexual acts. And then about the board, the board itself, when this came to light and there was scrambling to do damage control, was floating, lying to everybody, lying to donors, lying to people and saying, you know, Michael Voris, we'll just say he stepped down for health reasons. And the snake, Jim Graham, who was ousted from Texas Right to Life for the scandal involving adultery um, just a, a little while back, a couple years back, you know, he was dripping this into their ears. Well, we'll just uh, put Voris away. We'll make him go through a 12-step program. We'll, um, and then after a year or two, he'll come back. So we're going to say he's just stepping away for for reasons of health, you know, that was floated, that was debated upon, and was rather favorably received by several members of the board in crafting the explanatory statement. You know, he's just stepping away for health reasons. Um, and then bringing him back after he goes through this, uh, through some 12-step program uh, to, I guess, whatever, deal with the inner demons that are, that are haunting him and making him uh, act out in this, you know, the, the crime against nature. So that was the plan, uh, at least for some people on the board, uh, not unanimously, but for, for many on the board, this seems to be what they favored. And, um, you know, I spoke out against that vehemently. And the reason there's a morality clause violation in our statement, you know, we came out and said, Michael Voris um, violated church militants morality clause is because I put my neck on the line and, you know, members of the board called me hateful, by the way. And I said, no, he must never be allowed to come back. And we have to be honest with people about what caused him to go away in the first place, why he is being ousted from this organization in the first place. We owe people honesty and transparency. And we're going to see, I'm going to read you our vortices on Monsignor Grinder after this, and we'll see what flaming hypocrites we would have been if we had just let Voris, you know, waltz back in, um, you know, we send him away for a couple years at a token program or something and he waltzes back in and, pre and presumes to lecture sweet old ladies about the truths of the Catholic faith. It's disgusting. Uh, I'm not going to stand for people to be conned out of their money under false pretenses um, while still holding out a hope that Michael Voris is going to come back and be, you know, the, the savior of the Catholic faith right riding in on his white steed nope not today sorry that's not how it works you don't get to be a homosexual living a double life and then i mean you just sheer audacity it's despicable but that's what the option was that many of the members of the board were considering and like i said i stuck my neck out and run a ran a foul of them so much so that my employment was jeopardized from that point on you know i'd been a stellar employee for three and a half years, moved up to management um, and, you know, obviously doing well in terms of every tangible metric for, for being an employee, not a problem employee at all. But then I stick my neck out for this and um, that was the beginning of me getting my head lopped off. Uh, again, I was called hateful for simply bringing up the fact that men with deep-seated 
homosexual tendencies are not fit to be in Catholic ministry. And that's not Dave Gordon talking. That is, in fact, the Catholic Church. And we can get into that also in a second because that's what, um, you know, certain dicasteries have, in fact, made explicitly clear. So um, going to the map for that, put me out of favor with the board. I, I heard that I enjoyed the trust of the board until I took the stance that I took in that meeting regarding crafting our statement about the departure of Michael Voris. So I didn't want to lie to you guys. Some members of the board did. Jim Graham did. And the fact that we have that adulterer who's now glommed on to our organization is itself a problem. Personnel is policy. Personnel's policy. We don't do adulterers. Yeah, that's fine. I hope you're right with God. I'm glad you're right with God. That's not my thing to judge. You know, I'm not a judgmental guy. That also means I don't know if you're repentant. All I know is a couple of years ago, you had uh, an extramarital affair that was a matter of huge scandal and that got you ousted from your organization. So get out. Um, but that's what's going on there. And I'm going to, again, like I said, read the letter that I penned and was signed on to by many of my colleagues uh, to the board of directors about some of these things. Um, and this, of course, is apart from the board of directors simply not doing its job for 15 years, not knowing its own bylaws. It's absolutely despicable. And this is the board of directors that's now going to waltz in and think that it's going to fix the organization. The board of directors that didn't know its own bylaws until I taught it to them a week ago. Or two weeks ago. In preparation for ousting Michael Voris. You know, I just trusted they were competent. I would have no way of knowing that. And then it came to my attention that these ignoramuses don't even know how to run their own company. It's disgusting. So, um, I, I also want to talk to you and address the detraction thing. Because I've mulled on the detraction thing for a long time. I don't want to be making myself into a public sinner. Which would be a big deal in my book. Uh, you know, obviously it wouldn't be worth my soul even to expose certain types of rot if it came down to that. You know, I'm a son of the church and I will always attempt to make the good moral Catholic decision. But I've come to peace with the fact that this is not detraction. Uh, I'm going to read you about the, the relevant section on detraction what is and what isn't from Catholic Encyclopedia. Obviously, everybody has a right to their good name. That's just a natural right we have. People who are deserving of a good name have an absolute right to a good name. However, everybody else, sinners, people who have erred, so basically everybody in a certain capacity, they have a conditional right to their good name, which means that um, sometimes that conditional right to a good name is revoked for other purposes. It's, it's almost overwhelmed by the gravity of other considerations. And that's what's at play here. So while Michael Voris has a right to his good name and to not have his sins made publicly known um, a certain in most cases, that does not play out here because he's a public figure. He's a public figure. And also he's mulling coming back. He's coming mulling coming back uh, to church militant. As a matter of fact, at the last time I heard, he was still an advisory member of the board of Church Militant. Now, that's the last time I heard, which was a couple days ago. Um, I don't think that's changed, but maybe it has. So he hasn't even been fully ousted from the organization because he's still a non-voting member of the board of directors. Unbelievably. So guys, I'm going to read from the Catholic Encyclopedia's entry on detraction um, to kind of put a point on this. Uh, it says, quote, finally, even when the sin is in no sense public, it may still be divulged without contravening the virtues of justice or charity whenever such a course is for the common weal, the common good, or is esteemed to make for the good of the narrator, of his listeners, or even of the culprit. The right which the latter has to an assumed good name is extinguished in the presence of the benefit which may be conferred in this way. So, again, Michael's right to his good name is conditional. And the common good overrides that. And the fact is, public officials, people who put themselves in the public eye, who hold themselves up as paragons of virtue, as men to be admired and followed, they can be vetted more thoroughly. 
because you're putting out a message about the Christian gospel, well, your life becomes a little bit more of an open book. You can be vetted more thoroughly. And somebody who's living a double life, engaging in sins that cry to heaven for vengeance, that person has no place in the public eye. And so this sliding scale that he has um, to his good name, the common good uh, outweighs his conditional right to his good name when he's living a double life. You know, people need to actually have uh, models that they can look up to, uh, models of Catholic virtue. And, you know, he is not one. So therefore, that, that common good analysis overwrites the right to a good name. Furthermore, um, it's out of a certain sense of mercy for Voris himself that this gets exposed and the seriousness of these sins um, comes to light, uh, especially in light of the fact that we're thinking, you know, Michael might be trying to step back in to, to Catholic ministry in a couple years, as was floated. Um, that would be putting himself right back in a place to fall under the stresses and the pressures of being in the limelight. So it would not be good for him to come back to that. And therefore, this needed to be revealed. Guys, I hate to do this. Uh, I really do. Um, I'm not one to to make uh, appeals or, or um, you know, ask for largesse. Uh, but I, I guess times are a little tough right now. Uh, obviously, uh, several church militant employees just lost their jobs. I didn't get a severance or anything like that. Um, I'm kind of scrambling to find work. Uh, so first of all, if you guys know of any, you know, jobs that are opening up for like Catholic editors, please kindly let me know. But second of all, um, we have set up a, a group give, send, go, uh, for the church militant employees who left today, um, as, as part of this, I, whatever you want to call it. Uh, protest about the way things have been going at the organization. Uh, so if you would not mind, please, if you have the means, uh, we'd be much obliged if you would kindly support us in any way you can. Um, there are around 10 of us. And um, obviously, right around the holidays, this is a bad way for us. Um, I don't, I don't want to be out of work for long, but we find ourselves in a pinch. If anyone can actually help you know, I'd be appreciative of it. Um, I'd be most appreciative, as would many of my colleagues. So please kindly think about doing that. Okay, that said, um, I'm going to read this letter that we penned. Uh, this is an 11-19-2023 letter. Dear board members of St. Michael's Media, we, the undersigned St. Michael's Media employees, most especially in light of recent revelations, come before the board to implore you to take immediate action to remedy fundamental issues that threaten the very existence of this good apostolate. Each of us signatories has dedicated years of toil to the mission of the apostolate and far beyond yielding even diligent but detached labor as one does with a secular career, each has, at least in part, tethered his life and honor to the apostolate's mission and flourishing. We have, in other words, paid for our voice with abiding, steadfast, spirit-filled service. We now request to come forward and exercise that voice. No one man owns or is entitled to headship of St. Michael's Media. Likewise, no one is entitled to employment thereat. The apostolate is, by decree of law, not the alter ego of any individual. Rather, pursuant to the Michigan Nonprofit Corporation Act, the business and affairs of a corporation shall be managed by its board. Um, and this is also reflected in all our bylaws. I will spare you that. Um, as such, the, the directors owe the nonprofit, not its CEO, fiduciary duties of care, meaning they must exercise reasonable care and oversight and participate actively in decision making. Loyalty, meaning they must not use their position to pursue outside interests. And obedience, meaning they must ensure the nonprofit is dedicated to its stated mission statement and goals. Um, so... Just for reference, our mission statement, this is what our mission statement actually is. St. Michael's Media is committed to illuminating souls with the light and truth of Jesus Christ through mass communications, especially the medium of television. St. Michael's Media combats ignorance of the teachings of the Holy Catholic Church and defends her against slander and attack. 
Anyone who believes he owes a duty primarily to one particular man and not to church militant itself is unfit to serve on the board, as such a dangerously erroneous opinion contravenes the three duties set forth above. The board of directors um, is, under its bylaws, tasked with controlling the activities and tenure of the CEO, ensuring his vision accords with the overall mission statement of the apostolate. Um, yeah, simply put, the board is and has been since the formation of the apostolate, the boss of Michael Voris, not vice versa. And let me just editorialize. It's horrifying that they did not know this for around 15 years. Nevertheless, Michael Voris has bluntly speaking taken us far and wide from our mandated mission. The mission, mind you, that attracted church militant staff in the first place, with virtually no pushback or corralling from those with a legal duty to oversee him. Instead of acting as, a Catholic, as Catholic crusaders committed to evangelizing a depraved West, saving souls, and shielding the church and magisterium from reckless calumnies, we've largely degenerated into a religious news station obsessed with, partic- with secular politics and the sexual sins of wayward clerics. To the extent we now engage in ecclesiastical commentary, it's marred by a hermeneutic of suspicion and a tenor of dissent towards the living magisterium and the reigning pontiff. We have made ourselves the antagonists of our own bishops and therefore can no longer enjoy favor in the sight of God, for, as St. Ignatius of Antioch proclaimed, quote, wherever the bishop appears, there let the people be, even as wheresoever Christ Jesus is, there is the Catholic Church. Beyond these performance-based criticisms, we recall to the board's attention the allegations of Michael Voris's moral depravity contained in, and I'm editing out the name here, uh, the 11 16 2023 email, uh, which said, quote, and I am, I am actually literally quoting from the email that was sent internally um, from another whistleblowing employee that a church militant staffer went to Michael's house last fall and apparently witnessed porn featuring a gay orgy on his computer. He was too afraid to con- confront Michael about it. The staffer will confirm if necessary. A source claims Michael was recently seen three times at Adam's Apple, a well-known gay bar in Detroit, with a handsome younger man. Whether it's true or malicious rumor, this is what I was told. A screenshot of an illicit text message from Michael's phone was in Dropbox. That means the company's Dropbox account. It read, I jacked off to your hot pick. At first I didn't see the nipples. And the message was cut off. It was from a number I did not recognize. Simon saw it and has a copy. Um, Dozens of shirtless selfies and muscle pics from Michael's phone were inexplicably on Dropbox. Uh, You can see a couple attached. There were literally dozens like this. Simon has copies. I've learned Michael has been in the habit of sending shirtless selfies to multiple men inside and outside the apostolate. And on top of these allegations... It has come to our attention that Voris texted a potential large donor shirtless selfies, which directly caused this edited out donor to refrain from making very sizable donations to the apostolate. Um, a male employee, and this is me just adding this for your guys' knowledge, a male employee of Church Militant also stated that he felt like Michael was grooming him and several other staff members had noticed and remarked about their odd relationship and thought that it was inappropriate. Um, And finally, in that the board has heretofore failed to regularly meet or execute its legal duties to the apostolate, which includes setting the salary of the apostolate CEO. Um, It appears that Michael Voris has received a series of unauthorized pay raises over the course of several years, all while paying his employees virtual poverty wages, and therefore could perhaps be guilty of embezzlement under Michigan Penal Code Section 750.174, Section 1. And that reads, A person who has the agent, servant, or employee of another person, governmental entity within this state, or other legal entity, or who has the trustee, bailey, or custodian of the property of another person, governmental entity within the state, or other legal entity, fraudulently disposes of or converts to his or own, her own use, or takes or secretes with the intent to convert to his or her own use, without the consent of his principal, 
any money or other personal property of his principal that has come to that person's possession or that is under his or her charge or controlled by virtue of his being an agent, servant, employee, trustee, bailey, or custodian is guilty of embezzlement. For the foregoing reasons, we, the undersigned employees, request Michael Voris's immediate removal from his board director position, from his position as, as CEO of St. Michael's Media, and from any employment positions that he has with St. Michael's Media or affiliated organizations. Because the board has proven chronically undiligent in living up to its legal obligations under the Apostolate's Bylaws and the Michigan Nonprofit Corporation Act, we further request that we be consulted about and have the opportunity to give constructive input on the person to be named as Michael Voris's successor as St. Michael's Media CEO, on whom our future and the remedy to the aforementioned problems depends. At the outset, we cite Holy Writ to guide the discussions and the vetting of the future CEO. Therefore, a bishop must be irreproachable, married only once, temperate, self-controlled, decent, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not aggressive, but gentle, not contentious, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, keeping his children under control with perfect dignity. For if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how can he take care of the church of God? Um, and I'll edit the rest out of that. Because for time. Okay, I'll skip there. We look forward to seeing to, along with the members of the board, the continuing success and growth of St. Michael's Media. We only ask that we are given a more transformative role in such process. When we link arms and together strive for prudence, discernment, and wisdom, it will redound to the benefit of us all who are so keen on facilitating the mission of St. Michael's Media. Ave Christus Rex. Uh, yours faithfully, David Gordon and company. So when this stuff came out about Michael Voris's personal sins, you would think it would send board members and upper management scrambling to do the right thing and to find out about the truth of these matters. But when Christine Niles took um, this Dropbox, this, this message, the screenshot she found in Dropbox um, that said, I just jacked off to your hot pick and took it to Simon Rafe, he told her to to delete it. He told her to delete that message off her phone. And then he shut down our Dropbox account, which by the way, I was using for something else, which caused me great inconvenience. Without explanation, he shut down the Dropbox account. And then he didn't go demand an explanation from Michael Voris. So if this wasn't followed up on, and if new things didn't come to light, if it didn't come to light that Michael Voris, that an employee had witnessed Michael Voris with um, homosexual orgy pornography on his computer, then, you know, it, it, at least some people in-house were going to be burying this. But just by a stroke of luck or providence, um, more stuff just kept coming to light. And these allegations, it seems, at least the lion's share of them, are well taken, although I'm not fully privy to that information. Um, so this is really serious. This is the face of a Catholic organization who's holding self out as a paragon of virtue has descended into this type of sin. Uh, you can't, you can't make it up. You don't get to live a double life. You don't get to live, um, the life of a scoundrel and be the face of a major Catholic organization. And you don't get to demand that it be kept in the shadows when you have literally made your living demanding that other people's crimes be exposed, other people's sexual sins be exposed. The hypocrisy of all this, the, the cover-up of all this, with the board wanting to tell people, oh, you know, he's just sick, he's stepping away for health reasons, oh, um, you know, it's uh, he's going to go through a 12-step program, or that's the private plan, put him through a 12-step program, then just trot him right back as if nothing happened. Uh, it's despicable. I mean, our organization is the biggest hypocrites in the entire universe. I, I want to read to you from a, a vortex for, about Monsignor Grinder, Monsignor Jeffrey Burrell, that is from June 14th, 2022. It's called They Don't Care and They Never Have. Um, just hear me out because you'll see the obvious analogy, the obvious parallel buried in, in, in the vortex. 
A few days ago, Church Militant reached out to the Diocese of La Crosse asking about the whereabouts of Monsignor Jeffrey Burl, who came to be known as Monsignor Grinder. He got the nickname because media reports almost a year ago identified that through the use of the homosexual hookup phone app Grinder, he had been having homosexual li- liaisons with possibly hundreds of men. When the news broke, the gay cabal in the hierarchy immediately circled the wagons around him. First, Los Angeles Archbishop Jose Gomez, president of the U.S. Bishops' Conference, issued a bland statement that Burl was resigning his post with the Bishops' Conference immediately and that whatever he had done, it didn't involve boys. Then his own bishop, William Callahan, dutifully snapped to and issued his own Nothing Burger statement, merely acknowledging Gomez's statement. And just like that, no more Monsignor Grinder. He had been sucked into the fast cover-up network that the bishops have become so expert at operating. They get away with murder because they are accountable to no one on this planet and they know it. Hmm. Gee. Yeah, lack of accountability. Getting away with murder. Uh, burying stories. Making them go away. That sounds kind of familiar. They get money from you and they spend it on whatever they like while you can just kiss off. That is, until they want more from you. Then they tell you to donate so they can continue the work of the church. Since when did the work of the church involve hiding homosexual priests or deliberately hiding and obscuring the truth about the shenanigans that have so destroyed the faith in America? So on one level, it can't be surprising that this past weekend, Bishop Callahan reintroduced the freshly minted Monsignor Grinder to a parish as the brand new administrator, now back from months of reflection over something. Hmm. Kind of like trying to bring back Michael Voris after a couple of years in a 12-step program. You know, trying to just kind of sneak him back in, right? Uh, but what was he reflecting on? But what he was reflecting on was never told to anyone. But it must have been severe enough for him to go off and reflect on it for months, but not severe enough for the people to be told. Yet this is how these crooked homosexualist bishops and their staffs work. Hmm. I guess Church Militant is a crooked homosexualist organization because, hey, they weren't going to tell you. They weren't going to tell you that the face, uh, the the shining beacon of Catholic manhood, Michael Voris, was off doing homosexual things. They weren't going to let you know that. They were just going to shuffle him away. He was going to go through his 12-step program that Jim Graham uh, wanted him to go through. And then they were going to bring him back, sneak him back. They're, keep donating, though. Keep donating your money. Keep donating, donating to the mission statement. Uh, keep donating to the cause of Church Militant with its, you know, inept board that's breaching its fiduciary duties and the, you know, crooked, two-faced CEO who's secretly living a homosexual lifestyle. Continuing on. These men don't care about you, God, the faith, or anything. If they did, they would all come clean, but they don't and they won't. They are so screwed up in their heads that they actually believe they're right. They truly believe your role is just to shut up and give them money and they will run the show. As for actual information, the absolute barest of details will have to be enough. Hmm, that's weird. That's like what we're doing. From Bishop Callahan, Monsignor Jeffrey Burl has recently come off an extended leave from active ministry. During his leave from active ministry, Monsignor Burl engaged in a sincere and prayerful effort to strengthen his priestly vows and has favorably responded to every request made by me in the diocese. So now he's getting dumped into St. Teresa of Kolkata Parish in West Salem, Wisconsin, a small parish, but still a parish. We should note that diocesan insiders tell us that Callahan first tried to pawn him off to other bishops, but none of them took the bait. And I'll skip ahead. In short, it's not just the bishops involved in the cover-ups and deceit. It's also their staff, staff that have a very odd sense of loyalty, not to the truth and the church and the faithful, but to the man who signs their checks. So from the U.S. Bishops' Conference in the person of Gomez to Bishop Callahan and his secretary, not a single member of the gay cover-up circle has revealed a blessed thing about Monsignor Grinder that they have not been forced to reveal. And even then, it's always done in the most deceitful and cunning fashion possible. That sounds familiar. Since you're sticking him back in parish life, Bishop, is it fair to conclude your investigation is over? What are the findings? Who conducted it? Who paid for it? What were the recommendations? Were the charges you said had not been established, finally established? And are they true or are they not? 
Why hasn't Monsignor Grinder ever released a statement denying all this if it's not true? If it is true, why is being, he being allowed to continue in the priesthood, or at the very least in a parish? Do you really think, Bishop, that if any of this is true, that he should be anywhere around young males? Do you think, really, church militant, that if Michael Voris was grooming a young male employee, he, somebody of age, mind you, but a male employee, that he should really be back in our office space after a couple of years? You really think that, church militant? Like, are you freaking kidding? We had a trustworthy employee say that he was being groomed by Michael Voris. And you morons on the board want to bring him back after a couple of years. Or were flirting with it. Are you kidding me? After this vortex? Do you really think, church militant board, that if any of this is true, Michael Voris should be anywhere around, like males ever again, anywhere? Is it plausible to think, Bishop, that a man who has not denied his behavior has suddenly changed after a few months of prayer? Oh my gosh, the irony. Well, I'm just going to repeat it. It just exploded in my head. Is it plausible to think, Bishop, that a man who has not denied his behavior has suddenly changed after a few months of prayer? Was he not praying while he was offering mass before he got caught? Was he ever trying to hit on young guys in the church when the mood overtook him? How do we know he wouldn't do it again? Hey, those are really good questions, Church Militant Board. Those are really good questions you asked Michael Voris. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I don't think he should be around young men or men. So let's now apply that to you. Bishop Callahan, you lie to your people by silence and deflection. Nowhere has anyone in the church in this whole damnable scandal issued a peep of apology to the sheep or breathed a word of remorse for the damage caused to people's souls. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But this is how the clerical homosexual network works. They protect their own as long as it's not a kid. But if it's a consenting adult, meaning a male, then have at it. All bets are off. The gay clerics circle the wagons and we're off to the races. The cover-up machine kicks into high gear and not a single thing is and not a single thing is not expended on behalf of the homo cleric. Good heavens. So basically, church militant is kind of like a homo cleric organization, right, guys? Isn't it? Is it a, a homosexual network? We're going to circle the wagons around the two faced homosexual that's running church militant? Is that how you want to do it? They refuse to admit that they themselves should never have been ordained. They themselves should never have been admitted to seminary because they are gay. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. There is no way Monsignor Grinder should be allowed to continue as a priest, much less be set loose upon an uninformed parish. Again, I agree. Hooking up with hundreds of men on a phone app for homosexuals merits you a parish after the appropriate amount of reflection, but saying the truth, no, we can't have that. Oh my gosh. No wonder none of these men believes in hell. I'm they do believe in hell, actually. You can't say that about a whole group of people, but, you know, so can't slander people. None of these men believes in hell. They better hope they're right. Well, yeah, you should believe in hell. It, yeah. So anyway, obviously you can see the rank hypocrisy in there because that's what we are being geared up for. And that's what cost me um, largely the favor of my workplace um, that I spoke out against this uh, vehemently. I, I and another person spoke out against this idea vehemently of just saying that Michael Voris was having health issues and he's going away for a couple of years and then we're going to slowly shuffle him back in after a 12-step program. No, no, that's not okay. You know why that's not okay? Because here's what the um, Congregation for Catholic Education says. In the light of such teaching, this dicastery in accord with the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments believes it necessary to state clearly that the Church, while profoundly respecting the persons in question, cannot admit to the seminary or to holy orders those who practice homosexuality, present deep-seated homosexual tendencies, or support, support the so-called gay culture. Such persons, in fact, find themselves in a situation that gravely hinders them from relating correctly to men and women, 
one must in no way overlook the negative consequences that can derive from the ordination of persons with deep-seated homosexual tendencies. Different, however, would be the case, blah, 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 blah. Okay. And let's look at the 1917 Code of Canon Law. What does it say about um, clerics who engage in certain kind of behavior like sodomy? Um, if clerics engage in a delict against the sixth precept of the Decalogue with a minor below the age of 16 or engage in adultery, debauchery, bestiality, sodomy, pandering, or incest with blood relatives or affines in the first degree, they are suspended, declared infamous, and are deprived of any office, benefits, dignity, responsibility, if they have such whatsoever, and in more serious cases, they are to be deposed. Yeah, it's a really big deal, you guys. Um... And this, this was going to be covered up. So I, I wanted to get this out in front of everybody, let you know what was going on at Church Militant. Um, I know it's, it's a bit tedious and rambling at times, but I think exposing this is ultimately going to be good for, for everybody. It's good for the company. Now they're going to have to deal with this. Hopefully this yields for them um, a board of directors that has integrity. You know, and people now know what they're donating towards. And apparently you're donating towards unauthorized pay raises. Um, you're, you're donating to a board that wasn't even doing its very basic duty of overseeing the CEO for all of these years. You're donating to an organization, the face of which uh, was living a double life, at least for some, for some unknown amount of time. And hid, who is accused, and I can't attest to the veracity of this, of being at a gay bar with a handsome younger man. Um, somebody who, by appearances on Dropbox, ha has at least been receiving sexting messages, uh, who one employee said was grooming him. Guys, I know that's all a giant black pill, and um, sometimes you have to blow the whistle on this stuff. But... In light of that, you know, let me give the white pill, is that there still are some good people left at Church Militant, um, and that the organization, it has the infrastructure to do a lot of good, and its mission statement is still very pure. We just need to get rid of some of the inept people that are, are steering the ship, and if they could just get good leadership, you know, we still have a prayer of of making it into what it always should have been, which is truly um, kind of the shining beacon on the hill uh, that can give uh, great insight into Catholic doctrine, great Catholic evangelization, um, and, and protect the church against slander and attacks. So I leave you with that. I don't think it's a hopeless situation. I think people need to make their voices heard to the board of church militant. They need to tell these people to step down to appoint um, successors or to allow successors to be voted in who are men of goodwill, uh, prudent men, wise men that are going to take the company um, all the way forward and to make it what it should have been. So I do think there's that hope. Remember, the infrastructure is in place. The mission statement is in place. Now it just needs good people. Um, so that, that's a white pill for me. And there is a note of hope there. Um, I hope I haven't seen the last of Church Militant. Um, you know, I, I hope it, it can right the ship and do good things for the world. As for Michael Voris, you know, my, my heart goes out to him too. As angry as I am about what's transpired, and as angry as I am about the unfair employment consequences that that really yielded for me, um, and the things that I had to do per my conscience that put me out of good favor from Church Militant and many others out of uh, the good graces of Church Militant. Um, as mad as we are about that, you know, we worked with Michael Voris for a long time. And while he obviously has his demons, he's got a lot of really redeeming qualities. And, you know, I feel, I feel bad for him if I'm being honest with you. Um, homosexual issues are something that comes from deep childhood wounds. Um, every child, I was just looking at my kid, 
uh, the other night after I tucked him in, looking so peaceful in bed, so comfortable, so safe. And I started thinking about Michael and just, you know what? Maybe he was deprived of this as a child. Maybe he was deprived of this peace and this love and this sense of security as a child. And it's given him this terrible cross, this terrible cross of SSA, uh, homosexuality, whatever you want to call it. And he didn't deserve that. You know, that wasn't something that he deserved. And, you know, I'm thankful to him for a lot of what he's done for me and my family. He gave me a job. And that's no little thing, you know, that that deserves true gratitude. So I'm not trying to seem petulant or mad in any way. I mean, although I am mad, but at the same time, you know, my, my heart moves for Michael Voris. Um, he's a very talented man, and he's got a lot of good in him. At the same time, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean he has a right to be in the limelight in public ministry as a Catholic man. You just can't go from a life, an adult life of homosexuality into being in Christian ministry. I mean, I think according to the church ever but let alone over some short duration. You know, miracles don't happen like that, guys. The road to Damascus conversion, you know, it's, it's biblical. It's one in a trillion. It just doesn't happen like that. Um, but I do wish him all the best. I, I you know, he's, he's been in many senses a great champion for the faith. Um, his words have led many to convert. Um, and I, I hope he can really get past these, not struggles, cause he's always going to have those struggles. Everybody always, we have our certain vices, but I hope he can find, uh, happiness in life, joy, joy in life in service of the Lord and conquer these inner demons. Um, because yeah, having a cross like that to carry is not fair. And he did deserve security and love and potential paternal and maternal affection in full as a child. You know, he's a beloved child of God. Um, and it's, it's heartbreaking when anyone doesn't have that. And it, you parents will know, look at your kids tonight when you check on them, when they're asleep, looking so peaceful and safe and serene. You know, what Pius XII uh, calls the paradise of childhood. Some people are deprived of that and it sucks and it's not fair. And it's one of those theodicy points that I'll never understand. Um, but, uh, you know, let's pray for Michael Voris in a non-trite way, in a non-way where it's like that's just some throwaway line. Truly, he, he has many, many redeeming qualities. And he deserves a lot of our support. And I am grateful to him. Um, yeah, I mean, I wish I, I weren't like terminated and my employment severed from church militant for something I didn't, you know, really do. Um, that was, was damnable, but whatever. Um, yeah. All right, guys. Well, signing off, this is David Gordon. I hope this is informative, and I hope that this redounds to the benefit of all Catholics out there that are following this. Please do not despair. It's okay, guys. There are good Catholics. I know when a public figure falls, when somebody that we looked up to falls, it's it can be distressing, and some people even, it challenges their faith. I promise you, there are men of goodwill out there that are virtue, um, that are virtuous men. Like, I promise you there are virtuous men out there um, that are all that they act, uh, appear to be, that all that they act like, all that they say they are. Um, so just because, you know, one person falls, don't let that challenge your faith. Uh, the, 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 right, the right way is hard. The narrow path is hard and few find it. But there are a few. There are a few people out there to look to. So... Um, don't worry and, uh, good night guys. Please pray for me and kindly do support our, um, our fund here because there's a lot of people out of work right now. So give, send, go. I'm going to put it in the show notes. Um, 
please kindly, if you have the means, uh, help support us till we can find new jobs. God bless you guys.